chapter. If you will join me in turning to that passage at this time, we will read a few verses from the first part of that chapter here in just a moment. Certainly I'm appreciative to our elders for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I think that Lee would agree with me and that so many of you have been so kind to make us feel just like we're the regular preachers by reminding us about time constraints this evening. So we, uh, we appreciate you making us feel right at home. We, uh, we both are appreciative of the opportunity. I, I certainly thank the elders for the chance to speak before you this evening and, and also for their guidance in helping us choose a theme this year. I am very excited about the theme of always abounding. I think that maybe unlike any other theme they could have picked for us to follow in the year 2015, this theme presents us with a great opportunity because it's a theme that provides us with a great deal of motivation to strive to go forward, to move forward, to always try to abound and to do better. But at the same time, I think this theme also encourages us to be innovative, to think about how we can reach people, to think about how we can edify one another and in doing so, grow together and to become more spiritually minded. And this theme ties in perfectly with what I'd like to speak with you about this evening. You may recall an invitation that I did a, a month and a half or so ago. You may not. Uh, and in that invitation, I relate a story to you about a newlywed couple that were preparing a ham for a dinner they were having. And the husband looked at the ham that his wife was preparing, and he was a little bit curious because he noticed that when she was preparing that ham that she sliced off the end of the ham before putting it in the pot and then placing it in the oven. And just offhand, he happened to ask his wife, well, he was curious why she did that, so he said, honey, why do you cut the end off the ham before you put it in the oven to cook? And she said, well, I really don't know why. It's just the way that my mom had always done that, but I'll be happy to ask her. So the next time she saw her mom, she asked her that question. She said, mom, why is it that growing up, whenever you made a ham, you always cut the end off, put it in the pot, and put it in the oven? And she said, well, I'll be honest with you, that's just the way that your grandmother did it. So if you really want to know why, you're going to have to go and ask her. And so she went to see her grandmother, and she said, Grandma, why is it that when you always cooked a ham that you always began by taking a knife, cutting off the end of the ham, sticking it in the pot? You know, there must be some special reason for doing that. And she said, Child, the only reason I did that was because I didn't have a pot big enough to cook a ham. And that's the only reason I did it. Nothing special about it. Your ham would taste the same if you had just left the end on. So I give you that illustration to begin tonight by telling you that I'd like to talk with you a few minutes about the subject of traditions and how they relate to God's Word and what our attitude should be as a result. And I think that if we look at some key principles and what the Bible says about that topic tonight, then not only will it encourage us, but it will also help us to abound even more. So I think before we begin this discussion, it would be smart to make just a couple of brief definitions about some terms that we're going to be dealing with tonight. Let's look at Matthew chapter 15. We'll read the first three verses. Then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And Christ answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? So we have two words here that are presented to us, tradition and commandment. We'll deal with commandment first. I think we all understand the genesis and, and the meaning of what a commandment is. It's based on some form of divine revelation. You know, a law or a commandment is, is not alterable by us for any reason whatsoever. It is set in stone. We can't change it no matter how much may, that we may want to. Commandment in the Gospels is also used or translated as the Word of God in Matthew 15 and verse 6 and in Mark 7 and verse 13. It's also used in some Greek translations. The word law is used. In Luke 23 and verse 56, the word commandment is also equivocated with the law. So implied in the word commandment, law, or word of God, is a sense of obligation on our part to God. And Kenny talked a little bit about that on Wednesday in his class, that there is some accountability that we have when we see commandments or laws before us. And then accordingly, if we violate those commandments, those ordinances, those laws, then we are guilty of sin. And we see that in many verses throughout the New Testament. This other word, tradition, is from the Greek word that means instruction that has been handed down. Some people might think of it as an accepted way of doing things or talking about things. In Scripture, though, the word tradition is used in two entirely different contexts that I'd like to present to you. It is used in a sense where it is on equal footing with commandments. 
And we'll look at some passages in just a minute in 1 Corinthians and 2 Thessalonians where Paul is going to talk about that very principle. But tradition is also used in a bad sense in the New Testament. It is talked about as being hurtful and restrictive. Uh, and Christ and Paul both condemn that particular form of tradition in the New Testament. We read about this in Matthew 15 and verse 3 where Christ rebuked the Pharisees for their tradition. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Here in this passage, Paul writes, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So here we see that these traditions had been equivocated with God's word. They had become almost burdensome, as we see in Matthew 23 and verse 4, to those people. That's what the Pharisees had done to the Jews. They had placed burdens upon them by adding to God's word. And they had, and accordingly had prevented true freedom then in serving God and now serving Christ. I think that this kind of tradition, we, we all understand, evolves. That it's not something that is from God's word, so it is not steadfast and, and unchanging. But it is established by a habit or by a custom that may change or vary from one place, time, form, and may change, and that's okay. Those things are meant to change. But tradition is not evil in and of itself. It is a good thing when, it look, when you look at it in its basis form. It's an expedient. It can be accommodative. It's a product of, of human judgment, but it can be very helpful, and we'll see that in a few examples this evening. But what I would tell you that we need to be careful of, and that is the attitude that nothing in those kind of traditions, that we can never change those things. That's simply not a product of what we read about in the New Testament. The problem comes when we try to mandate human tradition on the same level that we mandate the Word of God and God's laws. We treat it as if it is something that is ironclad and it is completely unchangeable. And then accordingly, when we view it that way, then we tend to look at other people that may feel that we could change that tradition to do something better, then we look at them as being wrong or to take it to an extreme, even sinful and doing something that they shouldn't. And that's not an attitude that we should have. And so in, in discussing this issue, there's really two veins that we could explore. We're only going to do one in the short time we have this evening, but the first vein that we could look at would be the problem of watering down God's law into tradition. And I think you all know exactly what I mean there. And that's what we see that in the denominational world today and even in the church. That's where we take a a, God, a principle that we find in God's word or in his law, and we minimize it, we trivialize it, we remove the authority behind it, and as a result, all we're left with then is some form of a multiple choice doctrine that allows us to choose what we want to do based upon society, culture, or our personal choice. And we're not going to go down that road tonight. I think it would be a great study to do that. But the road that I want to focus on in the time we have left is the problem that we run into when we attempt to turn tradition into God's law and his commandments. And I believe that you would agree with me that that is a problem that we find in, in the Lord's church today and that it can be detrimental to growth, to always trying to abound and to move forward in spreading the gospel. You know, I think we can find many examples of this in, in the New Testament. And I think that you would agree with me that the greatest concentration of verses that deal with this particular problem is found in the gospels and that deals specifically with the Pharisees as we started out this evening. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Mark, chapter 2. Mark, chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. Blake has done a good job in leading us in a study on Sundays through the book of Mark, and he covered this verse, verses 23 through 28. One Sabbath, talking about Jesus here, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look! Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So here we have an instance where the Pharisees observed the disciples plucking grain because they were hungry to eat, and it happened to be the Sabbath day. And obviously the Pharisees had a big problem with this because they accused them of breaking God's law when they said, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do. Now using scripture, 
Christ refuted them. He told them that what you were doing was wrong and, abu- and rebuked them accordingly. And the Pharisees were wrong. They had turned their traditional interpretation of God's law into a, a system of minutia that was impossible for anybody to keep. And so they were not keeping with the letter of God's law, but had added a law to it that was simply not what God had intended. Now let's look at Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. I'm not going to take the time to read all 13 verses, but that's why I read those first three verses to begin our study. It's the same example here that we're dealing with where the disciples had gathered. They were going to eat a meal. Some of the religious leaders in the Jewish community were present. And the Pharisees were questioning Christ's disciples regarding the washing of hands before they ate a meal. They apparently weren't doing this, or some of them weren't doing it. I don't know if there had been instances otherwise where they had noticed it. But anyway, they had a big problem with this and, and were confronting Christ about it. Now, their motive here was not simply because they were grossed out because the disciples had dirt on their hands before they sat down to eat a meal. I believe we all know that. That was not their, their motive. I, you know, they, you may have a problem with that. I may have a problem with that. But that was not where the Pharisees were coming from in this instance. To them, this was simply a violation of law that it was a test of spirituality, a part of God's pattern in their mind that everybody should adhere to and follow to the letter. And Christ, and Christ again condemns them for this. He tells them this is not an attitude that they should have. And again, he's not condemning them because cleanliness is wrong. I mean, I'm personally a big fan of cleanliness. I think that it's an important thing to wash up before you eat a meal or before you do anything. I, I just think that's a good thing. That's the way I was raised. I'm sure that's the way a lot of you were raised. But that's not where Christ is coming from here. Christ is condemning them because this was a tradition that they had built up around God's law that they had now equated with the law itself. And as a result, they had made it a sin then if you didn't wash your hands before you sat down to eat a meal. Now, you may have heard the phrase growing up, you know, if you didn't wash your hands, you know, that cleanliness is next to godliness. But you're not going to find that here in, in the New Testament. And that's what Christ is pointing out. At its core, I think that He's condemning these actions because of where they were deriving their law from. That they were bringing it, they were deriving it from the wrong source. It was not from God's law. He was condemning them because they had made this law from the traditions that they had set forth. The traditions of men. Specifically these Jewish religious leaders. In essence what they were talking about here and what they were doing and what I would tell you is that when a practice is forced and justified because this is the way that these men thought it should be done because that's the way they had done it for hundreds of years and that's the way we're always going to do it then they were appealing to the wrong source they were not appealing to the source which is God's word they were appealing to what they felt it should be and that's why they were wrong you know we should we all know that right and wrong is not determined by the traditions that we set forth it's determined by what we read here in God's word. And it's simply unacceptable for a Christian to have an attitude that thinks otherwise the way that I think. You know, before, and, you know like I said earlier, before I go any further, I think it's important that we, say, that we point out that tradition, as I said, is not in and of itself wrong. Clearly the Bible tells us that there are certain traditions that are good, that are, we are to embody, that we are to have in our daily lives. And that's what I mentioned to you earlier. Look over in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Here Paul writes to the Corinthians, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them unto you. And then we'll also look over in the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or or by our letter. So what's the difference? You may ask, well, Rye, what, what are you getting at here? What's the difference in what the Pharisees were doing and what Paul's saying here? The difference is the source. The difference is that Paul was teaching them God's word and his revelations that we learn about in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13. God's word, his teachings, his revelations, and his thoughts were handed down through divine inspiration to Paul. Paul then in turn handed them down to these first century Christians, and then we also have them because of the revealed word that we have today. So it was the source. God was the source of these traditions that Paul was handing down. The Pharisees were the source of their traditions. Traditions can be wise. They can be expedient. They can be accommodating. They can be good because they help us know what to do. You know, if we just showed up here on, on Sunday morning and we had a huddle, 
and said, okay, how you want to do the service today? That wouldn't, really, that wouldn't be very organized. It wouldn't help us to try to glorify our God in an orderly and an acceptable fashion. So we have certain traditions that we put in place in order to facilitate those things. A song leader is an example of a tradition. It's a good tradition. It helps us to organize our worship in song, so it's done in an orderly fashion. The order we choose to engage in worship, the structure of our Bible classes, teaching and worship aids, those are all very good things, but they're all traditions of men. They're not things that we necessarily find in the Scripture, meaning they can be changed when they need to be. And there's nothing wrong when we do do that. Our elders have done that in the past year. They have changed the way we do certain things in our Bible studies and in our worship services because they felt that it would be better for us and it would help us focus and would help us to do better in our worship to God. And that is a very good thing. But what we have to be so careful of today regarding traditions is our attitude. And that's what is in our heart. We have to make sure that we don't treat them as something that is unalterable and something that can't ever be changed. We have to remember what our attitude is when, when somebody suggests that we maybe do something a little bit different. As long as it falls within the parameters of God's word, we cannot have the attitude when a brother or sister comes to us suggesting we maybe do something different that we immediately gripe about it or that we criticize that person for being a meddler or dare we even call them liberal. I mean, if they're not doing anything outside of God's word, then we don't have a right to do that. And if we harbor these attitudes, then we can never be about the business of always abounding because we're always going to be stuck where we were because we're griping and we have a negative attitude and we're not working together to accomplish good things. And I would also say that we need to remember also that the things that we find ourselves doing in worship services now may have been looked at unfavorably by Christians 100 years ago. You know, when people first suggested taking the Lord's Supper in multiple cups instead of one cup, or when people suggested splitting up Bible classes by age instead of everyone meeting together, or when PowerPoint projectors were first put into worship services. I'm sure there were people that had problems with that. But that doesn't mean that they were sinful. And so we need to remember that those people may have looked at us the same way today. So we need to remember what our attitude is and what our focus should be. You know, changing a service time or a class organization or the way that we advertise or the way that we communicate or reach other people to a different shape, form, or fashion, as long as it stays within God's law, we don't need to look at that as a problem. We need to look at that as an opportunity to do good, to help each other, and to press on. Having a problem with it comes when it becomes something that is not in God's word, and that's when we need to step in. We need to say something about it. We need to try to correct the situation. And as I close my thoughts to you tonight, I would just say to you that from my heart, I sincerely hope that, that I and that you will seek to have that same attitude as we move forward this year with our theme of always abounding that we would all seek to develop a deeper and a richer understanding of God's word to know what is our standard. And that when we know what our standard is, we'll know what is essential. And at the same time, then we'll know what's simply incidental. And I, and I truly believe that if we're serious, that if we're really serious about this theme that the elders have put forth to us of always abounding, then we must both follow God's word, but at the same time, we must be willing to step outside of ourselves. We must be willing to challenge ourselves, to grow spiritually, to reach out to other people we have never done, to, done so before, to spread God's word by any idea and any acceptable means in God's sight that we can think of. That's what I'm going to try to be about the business of doing this year, and I hope that you will too. And as if we do that together, I truly believe that we will abound, that we will grow both numerically, spiritually, God will be glorified, and we will be a blessed people. Thank you so much. After this song, we'll have the second lesson, and after the second lesson, we'll have the invitation. Number 70, Mansions Over the Hilltop. Mm. I'm satisfied with just a cup below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city, when the rain will shine, I want. Someday 
That was a <coughs> great job by Ryan. If some of you guys are sitting out here thinking, man, that was good, I would hate to follow that. Well, now to follow that. Again, I sh uh, share my appreciation with the elders as well as the members here. It is a great, a great um, it's good to be up here speaking this morning. Research shows us that the more friendships a person has in the congregation, the less likely they are to become inactive or leave. A survey was done several years ago of approximately 400 people who had left their groups, and they were asked, why did they leave the groups where they worshipped? Over 75% of the respondents answered in the following way, I didn't feel like anyone cared whether I was there or whether I wasn't. Now I ask you this evening, should these results be shocking? The church is the place where should be one of the most caring places in the world. And I think we would all agree with that. Well this evening I would like to take a few minutes to look at a few aspects of our fellowship and our work together. I believe that our working together as a collective body is essential to the well-being of the group here as well as to our well-being individually. And I think we all need to understand the importance of this collective work so that it's not overlooked or definitely not taken for granted. So let's start with the question. Do you see a problem with solo Christianity? What's that, you ask? Solo Christianity. It's a concept of Christianity which results in minimal involvement of the individual with the congregation of which they're a part. These solo or independent Christians are isolated and solitary in their work and in their service to Christ. We read early in the book of Genesis that God determined it was best that man not be alone. I think this is true both socially as well as spiritually. I personally believe that the consequences of this solo Christianity, this, this minimalist involvement attitude of Christianity are dangerous, include attitudes of bitterness, unhappiness, inactivity, and spiritual stagnation. The bottom line is this. I think Christians rarely survive and definitely do not thrive apart from their proper relationship together. We're all familiar with a group of coals or embers. You take one away, and it, very quickly that ember cools and dies. And I think our Christianity, our, our attitudes follow that same logic. Now, this Christian togetherness is seen in several words in the Scripture. We read of fellowship. We read of brotherhood. We read of membership. In the second chapter of Acts, in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. They, devo they devoted themselves to fellowship. Now, this fellowship, it's a common life of close association in which all that they did was in common, all that they possessed was possessed in common, so that they seemed to share one heart and one mind. Now, fellowship may apply to anything which may be possessed in common or which everyone may participate. Thus, all Christians, we all have the same hope of heaven, the same joys, 
the same hatred of sin, the same enemies to contend with. Thus, we all have the same subjects of conversation, of feeling, and of prayer. We are all fellows. We read in Ephesians 2.19 that we're fellow citizens, members of his household. In Ephesians 3.6, we're fellow heirs in the promise of Christ Jesus. Colossians 4.7, we're fellow workers in the kingdom of God. Colossians 1.7, we're fellow servants. In Philippians 2.25, we're fellow soldiers. We read of brotherhood, 1 Peter 2, verse 17. We're told to love the brotherhood, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, love the brotherhood, the whole fraternity of Christians who are in the household of faith, of whatsoever nation, whatsoever circumstance in life. We see a great example of this meaning of brotherhood, which was even mentioned by Blake this morning in the third chapter of Mark in verse 31 through 35. Soon after the apostles had been appointed, Jesus was in a home surrounded by most likely his apostles, several disciples. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated around him. Here are my mother and my brother. Who, whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. You see, we need to have a family consciousness about other Christians, understanding that our membership in Christ's family is more important than our membership in our human family. As we look at membership in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, we see now that you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part. Ephesians 1, we're told that Christ is the head and God placed all things under his feet, under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything in the church. The members are interdependent, Ephesians 4.16, from, the, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And in Romans 12.5, we read, so, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You see, Christ is the head of his body, in which we are all members who are functionally interde interdependent and belong to one another. Now, I think we see this. We understand that we're all fellows and brothers, that we're all members one to the other. So how should this affect the way that we, act, the, the way that we interact? Every day, an old man sat in his rocking chair with his granddaughter outside an old gas station, greeting tourists who passed through their town. One day, a man who seemed to be looking somewhere to live asked, so what sort of town is this? What sort of town do you come from, the old man asked. The tourist answered, everyone criticizes everyone. It's really bad. That's just the way it is here, said the old man. A few days later, another man stopped and asked, so what sort of town is this? Well, what sort of town have you come from, the old man asked. Well, it's great, the man said. Everyone gets along well. That's just the way it is here, said the old man. After the man left, the granddaughter looked up to him and said, how come you told the first guy this was a bad place to live and the second guy you told him it was a good place to live? Because wherever you go, you take your attitude with you and that what makes it, makes it a good or a bad place. To me, it's all about attitude our attitude toward one another. And that's what I'd like to look at for the next few minutes here this evening. What are some of the attitudes that we must maintain as God's family, as members of God's family? These attitudes are very clear in Scripture. They don't need much discussion. But at times it seems they're so, so very hard to maintain. We must show concern and care, 1 Corinthians 12, 25 through 26, so that there should be no division in the body, 
but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Humility or lowliness, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. We must have a peacefulness based on the word of God. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. We must have an appreciation for others and for their work. Philippians 1, 3 through 5. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. We must be willing to work together. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 and 22. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. We must have a friendliness, a warmth, and an openness towards each other. As we continue our reading in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had the need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We have to have a gentle and meek spirit. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. There's also this attitude of gentleness and meekness when there's discipline that has to be taken care of. In Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourself, or you may, you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We must be kind, compassionate, forgiving. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. John 13, 34 through 35, a commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. We must maintain a prayerful attitude. We must pray for, pray for other Christians, especially the Christians of this group. In Philippians 1, 9 through 11, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. As Paul prays for these congregations in, in, in the letters in which he wrote, he always thanks God for what is strong in that group, and he always asks God to help in areas where they're weak, and I think we should follow in this example. When we meet together, we need to do so in a manner that provokes each other. We read in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds. Not giving up on meeting together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, together, our union is strength. Our continual assembling together, they promote and foster love. They give us opportunity to provoke each other to good works by exhorting one another. We must have a unified spirit. 
John 17, 20, verse 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And finally, we need to be encouraging and patient towards one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, And disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And in Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceit. I think if we fully accept and practice these attitudes that appear very clear, it will not only strengthen us individually, It will strengthen our relationships with one another, resulting in a stronger group of God's people. Not only this, it will eliminate all the things that cause destruction and division among God's people. So as we continue to work together as brothers and sisters, as fellows, let's continually focus on our attitudes as we do the work of a local group of God's children. And I think nowhere is the wisdom of God more beautifully displayed than the relationship that God gives Christians to one another. Now you see there is only one way to benefit from this fellowship, to receive the friendships, the strength, the admonition, the instruction the prayers offered on your behalf, the benevolence when needed, the comfort in sorrow, the the assistance in difficulty, and the joy of being together. And that is to become a God, to become a child of God through baptism for the remission of sins. So if you are ready to begin this walk with God, we ask that you come as we stand and as we sing.